I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. The Gulf Coast doesn't just have a prayer, it has many prayers, as it hopes for a miracle following the oil spill. We'll have the latest. First, the sisters, now a special celebration for brothers in the Diocese of Brooklyn. It's a time when we can say thank you, which is always important. And get smart with wisdom art, cutting edge work from artists you might not expect. I'll never hold a plate brush before until I started this class. Everything I see, I want to try to enjoy. Well, good evening, thanks so much for joining us. The Catholic Church has been heavily involved with relief efforts in the Gulf Coast following last month's disastrous oil spill. And relief couldn't come soon enough for the thousands along the coast affected by this environmental emergency. The damaged BP oil line is causing millions of gallons of crude to spill into the Gulf. And one official says the effects on the ecosystem and the fishermen who depend on it for their livelihood could be felt for years to come. It's a situation that's got people praying for a miracle, literally, as we hear now from Carrie Chow in Alabama. As one looks far into the distance off Dauphin Island, there appears to be a point in the Gulf where the heavens become one with the high seas. Nearly 150 people at Dauphin Island are praying that one might be able to help what's in the other. In some of their statements, it was like, we need a miracle. So in our coming together, we just felt like that the miracles that we know come from God. And so we just need to come together and pray and ask God to perform that miracle that would uh, help solve this problem. From New Orleans to Destin, people are praying at 15 different locations across the entire coast, hoping that their faith can keep the Gulf looking as picturesque as that. We're not trying to get God to decide where the oil should go. Everybody's going to hurt from it. So what we do want God to do is just contain it and, and dry it all up. In our Gulf Coast, Lord, perform a miracle. Organized and by the Gulf Coast Christian Evangelistic Association, around 1,000 people across the Gulf Coast met at 7 p.m. and prayed together for an end to the oil spill. And I just believe that when we come together as not Baptist or Methodist or Assembly of God, or not black and white or Asian. We come together as believers. God hears our cry. Keep your voice on the coast. A cry that's ringing across the entire Gulf Coast. Well, one area that has been hard hit is the Louisiana coast. They just got word of some much needed relief though. That's right, BP America has announced it's donating a million dollars to Catholic Charities for the Archdiocese of New Orleans. I had a chance to talk about that and other things, including the situation along the Gulf Coast with Tom Costanza of Catholic Charities in New Orleans. Tom, thanks so much for joining us here today on Currents. We really appreciate your time, sir. Well, thank you all for uh, lifting up this uh, issue and uh, what the church is doing in response. Well, we're glad to do it. Now, first of all, I just want to get a quick up update from you, if we could, about the situation there on the ground, what you guys are dealing with. How are things, and, and what are you seeing? Well, you know, there's two basic uh, events happening here. There's certainly the, the oil spill itself and the environmental and the concerns uh, for protecting the coastline and all the things that the Paris governments are doing to try to prevent the oil from getting into our marshes, which would be uh, catastrophic for the industry. But the other issue is a human tragedy and the human needs we're seeing uh, in these fishing communities where we, are, we have set up a, a base at our Catholic churches in these fishing communities. And the daily, the needs coming in and, and the, the unknowns and the anxiety, that, that sort of the human the human side of this that sometimes gets overlooked uh, in the media right now. Yeah, I was I was looking at uh, as I was preparing to talk to you some some uh, research here, and actually the the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration (NOAA) as they're known um, says that now they've now closed about 46,000 square miles. That's about 19 percent of federal waters in the Gulf because of this oil spill. So it's obviously something that's having a great effect. Well, I guess great isn't the proper term to use. A very, very bad effect on the fishing industry there in the Gulf. We, uh, I mean, our diocese has many coastal beaches in it, as you might imagine, in lower Louisiana. And uh, we have many of our persons that are fishermen. And 
uh, now they, they can't go out and make a livelihood, and there's a lot of uncertainty uh, surrounding that. So um, uh, we think we have about 12,000 fishermen in our archdiocese that have licenses that would be directly impacted, and the numbers just exponentially increase if you start talking about seafood processing uh, people and people involved in uh, the oyster shucking piece of the industry. So uh, the deckhands that work on the boats, uh, you, you know, it, it the economic impact uh, can be significant. Right. And what is Catholic Charities there doing to help uh, these people who are in need? Well, uh, about three weeks ago, I ran this bill, uh, the Archbishop was at a meeting with Governor Jindo, and the Archbishop, uh, you know, offered his help as church. And, uh, you know, what we did was began to do our field assessments. Uh, so we went out into the churches and talked to the pastors, uh, talked to the fishing communities, and tried to identify the high-impact areas and began to set up uh, operations. And so we were fortunate to have parish structures with family life centers and and uh, double wives and certain uh, that we could easily ramp up and the pastors were, wanted it to happen. So we were immediately on the ground uh, interacting with the fishing community, uh, delivering counseling and, and partnering with our second harvest food program because uh, Food is the issue, major issue right this minute uh, that we're looking at. And so we began, uh, and then we began interacting with the uh, British Patrol and BP community outreach staff and getting them to understand the dynamics and uh, beginning them to see the, the issues from a community level. And we've had some success with that relationship uh, so far. Well, and I also understand, uh, one more thing, as, as far as your efforts go, I also understand that um, uh, BP, uh, BP America, uh, which is one of the companies uh, involved there at the Deepwater Horizon oil rig uh, and uh, the drilling and, of course, uh, all, uh, all the goings on there at Deepwater Horizon, um, has now donated, BP has now donated a million dollars to Catholic Charities, or at least they've announced that they're going to do so. How did that come about, and, and uh, what is the money going to go for? Well, you know, uh, I met with, uh, I brought the British BP uh, Community Outreach uh, Vice President Dave Kennard, uh, a little small Catholic parish in Point Lahash, and he looked into the eyes of these fishermen and basically had a conversion experience. And uh, then we were there, and he, he looked at Catholic Charities and he said, I've worked with Catholic Charities before. You know, the disasters, I trust you. I trust that you will account for the money properly, and I trust that you will work with the wider community mm -hmm. in addressing this. And so we, it was really a human story where there was this direct interface with fishermen at this small African-American fishing village in lower Louisiana mm -hmm. that, that started this whole process along with the archbishop, providing mm -hmm. a lot of leadership, meeting with the parish presidents, uh, being very visible, and then our staff out in the field actually delivering and providing services that they could see. Right. I think I think it was just that actual immersion in the in, in the experience that that made it happen. Right. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much, Tom Costanza. That's all the time we have uh, for this time around. But thank you so much for joining us here on Currents today. Best of luck, and our prayers go with you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now, in other news about the relief effort, Second Harvest Food Bank member agencies have reported a 15 to 25 percent increase in the number of new people looking for emergency food assistance. Well, stay tuned. There's much more current straight ahead. When we return, we'll have the day's headlines, including a big question for Supreme Court nominee Alina Kagan. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Coming up later, some unconventional artists put their work on display. But first, let's have a look at today's headlines. Well, we now know when Senate confirmation hearings will get underway for President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court. Senate leadership announced today the Judiciary Committee would begin hearings for Elena Kagan on June 28th. Kagan is U.S. Solicitor General and the President's pick to replace the retiring Justice John Paul Stevens on the High Court. 
The announcement came a day after a prominent House Democrat called on Judiciary Committee members to grill Kagan about her stand on abortion. New York Congresswoman Louise Slaughter wrote a letter calling on senators to make sure the nominee supports abortion rights. Slaughter expressed concern over a memo Kagan wrote in 1997 encouraging President Clinton to stand behind a bill limiting late-term abortions. A group of Catholic doctors in Phoenix, Arizona says it supports the local bishop's actions after an abortion was performed at a Catholic hospital there. Bishop Thomas Olmsted rebuked hospital staff for allowing the abortion and said any Catholics involved were automatically excommunicated. The Catholic Physicians Guild of Phoenix agrees, saying in a statement that abortion is never justified by circumstances. An ethics committee at St. Joseph's Hospital approved the procedure after determining it was the only way to save the mother's life. Hospital executive sister Margaret McBride was a member of that committee, but she has been reassigned. The diocese says she's been excommunicated because she gave her consent to the abortion. In Rome, Pope Benedict reflected on last week's trip to Portugal. During his general audience today, the pontiff gave his first extended remarks since returning to the Vatican. We get more now from H2O News. A touching experience rich with many spiritual gifts was how the Pope described his pilgrimage to Portugal during the general audience catechesis on May 19th. In Fatima, the Blessed Virgin invites everyone to regard Earth as the place of our pilgrimage to our final homeland, which is heaven. In fact, we are all pilgrims and we all need our mother who guides us. With you, we walk in hope, wisdom, and mission, was the motto of my apostolic trip to Portugal, the Pope said, and in Fatima, the Blessed Virgin Mary invites us to walk with great hope, letting ourselves be guided by the wisdom from above, which was revealed in Jesus, the wisdom of love, so as to bring Christ's light and joy to the world. Let us also pray that, through the intercession of Mary Most Holy, the Holy Spirit may render this apostolic trip fruitful and enliven in the whole world the Church's mission, founded by Christ to announce to all peoples the gospel of truth, peace, and love. Well, the Pope has lost the confidence of some Italians in the wake of the clergy sex abuse scandal. A new poll published in the newspaper La Repubblica shows confidence in the Pope in Italy stands at 47 percent. That's down from 54 percent in 2007. The survey also shows 62 percent of Italians believe the church sought to minimize or cover up sex abuse allegations, and a majority of those surveyed believe priests should be allowed to marry. And finally, back in this country, the American missionary accused of trying to take nearly three dozen children out of Haiti after the January earthquake is back home. Laura Silsby returned to Boise, Idaho Tuesday after being held for nearly four months in a Haitian jail. Kim Fields reports. This is the moment Laura Silsby waited three months and nine days for. She first hugs her sister Kim Barton and then her mother. Silsby turns to her sister again for another hug and then to our cameras as we ask her how it feels to be home. It feels incredible. It feels incredible. I just give praise to my God. I thank him for bringing me home. What have the last three months and, and nine, ten days been like for you? You know, I'll talk about that maybe at a later time. Today is a day of celebration. Enjoy my family and my friends and I've longed for this for a long time. Silsby says she is looking forward to spending time with her children and while swarmed by reporters and photographers, took time to thank her supporters for their prayers. Is that what's gotten you through this, your faith? Absolutely. God has been there with me every single day. He has given me strength and peace through every moment of this trial. And how does it to hold your mother's hand right now? How does that feel? It feels awesome. It feels wonderful. How does it feel to have her home? It's wonderful. After taking questions, Silsby then finds her way to Nicole Lankford, one of the women detained with Silsby in Haiti. <laughs> then she finds fellow detainees Silas Thompson Steve. and Steve McMullen and hugs and thanks them both for their support. Shortly later, Silsby's pastor, Clint Henry, leads the group in prayer. God, we're just grateful for her homecoming. The group of friends, church members, and family then break out into song. Silsby sings while embracing her sister, Kim Barton. Later, we talk with Karina Lankford, another woman detained with Silsby in Haiti. She looked really good. I thought she was skinnier, 
but she still looked really good. Lankford says Silsby looked happy, as she always looked, even in Haiti, when the group didn't know what the future would hold. Laura, in, in tomorrow or in two weeks or two months, said, all right, nine of you, let's go again, let's do it again. Would you do it again? Oh, yeah. I'm right there with her. Really? Absolutely. Why is that? Because I don't, Laura did absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, none of us did anything wrong. We were there to help those kids. We did everything by the book that we thought we were told to do, and Laura did absolutely nothing wrong. A sentiment expressed just minutes earlier by Silsby. God sent us to help the children of Haiti, and I truly went there with a desire to help those children. And that is Kim Fields reporting. Well, stay tuned. There's much more currents coming up. Just ahead, they may look like priests, but these men who follow a slightly different vocation get honored. I never looked on that as a challenge. I looked at it as, as a, a privilege to serve. Welcome back. Well, this spring has been a season of celebrations, everything from First Communions to Confirmations and also some graduations thrown in there. And people in religious life are getting into the spirit of the season as well. Absolutely are. Religious brothers marking their jubilees, some of them in religious life for 50 or 60 years. They all gathered in Douglaston, Queens last week to celebrate some major milestones. This is an occasion that happens every year. The Diocese of Brooklyn is very good in recognizing the contribution of religious women, men, and next week we'll have the priest jubilee. People do feel appreciated when you have a special mass for them and a dinner. It's a time when we can say thank you, which is always important. Today The vocation to be a brother is unique. It's not the vocation of being a priest. The priest is someone who receives holy orders, celebrates the sacraments. Rather, brothers are vowed to, to service in the church, just like the religious sisters. They do various things that build up the body of Christ in the church. Their vocation is a unique one. It's special. It's, uh, it depends on the person, if they feel themselves called to it. Many times uh, they've come to know brothers through school or other activities, and then they aspire to do the same thing. So it is a different vocation from that of the priest. Before we uh, serve dessert, we do want to acknowledge uh, the presence of those jubilarians that are here with this small gift. I enjoyed doing all of the works that I did as a Franciscan brother in, in our diocese. And there's no question about the fact that uh, I would make that same decision again. I never looked on that as a challenge. I looked at it as, as a, a privilege to serve, uh, to do the best I could every day. I always looked on it as a privilege and uh, a, a great joy to serve. The brothers are a very strong body in the church. and. Um, Sometimes they do get like a, a second step behind the priests or even behind the sisters because they're a small group. But our brothers have been very strong in the diocese. They participate very well. They come to almost every diocesan function or anything that my office would run. So I'd say for Brooklyn Diocese, the brothers are very active and they uh, participate very well in everything. What would I say to a young man today? After a very serious consideration, you have to think that I must commit myself to something, something that is uh, significant, something that uh, is important, and something that is satisfying. I found all three in Holy Cross. 
commitment to something significant, important, and satisfying. Love that. And and obviously he found it, as he said there, has been, uh, you know, in service for a long time. And that's what it's all about. You, you know, you think about religious brothers and it really comes down to service, as Bishop DiMarzio mentioned. I mean, they are, uh, you know, they t take a, a vow to, to, you know, be of service to people inside the church and outside the church as well. Yeah, always uh, wanting to give that support and not looking for the limelight, obviously. Right. <laughs> really looking to be able to provide it uh, and as they did for decades and decades so thank you to them stay with us there's much more current still to come when we return these local men and women get drawn in to an unexpected new outlet I just happened to see the art class and I said hmm maybe I would like to try that Finally tonight, you're about to meet some talented new artists who are making a splash in the art world. I love it. You don't find them in the East Village or in Soho, but right here in Brooklyn. And the trendy studio that is supporting their work is the St. Charles Jubilee Senior Center. It's run by Catholic Charities. <laughs> For sure. All the artists are senior citizens, and they're showing the rest of us what it means to truly make your life a work of art. The art program allows an artistic outlet for seniors so that they can express themselves as individuals and so that they can come together as a group and support each other artistically. Initially I came to the senior center to do the yoga chair exercises and then I just happened to see the art class and I said, hmm, maybe I would like to try that. I found myself coming for the lunches and then coming to the art class. So even before I retired, I was into the art classes and had a lot of fun with it. Everything is really here. You don't have to go out and buy a brush, buy a paint. What's wonderful about the art class and about older adult services in general is that some of the seniors don't even realize that they're artists until they actually come to the class. I've never held a paintbrush before until I started this class two years ago. Now since I started the program, everything I see, I want to try to draw it to see how it will turn out. Some people think they have to do a pretty line or make pretty colors. They worry too much about outcome and not the process. You know, the process is more important than the outcome. And if you can marry yourself to the process, the outcome can be incredible. I can just take plain white paper and fill it with colors and uh, dribbles and drabs. They were willing to use any kind of materials. They, they were much freer. They didn't just copy things. They didn't just copy old masters. I, I like to sit at my window and I can see the backyard and everything in it. So I just sit there and draw what is outside and I love it. Their work rivaled anything that my peers were doing. So I thought, well, how great would it be to, you know, focus on this kind of art at this stage of a person's life. Life memories can be put into a painting. Two pictures that are in the artwork uh, actually reflect the past in a sense because one is uh, when my son was young playing in the snow and then uh, the Brooklyn Bridge. And the culmination of this show, I mean we've been dreaming about this for a decade. It was about what senior citizens can do and produce that can rival young hip artists that are showing, well, we can do it too. It's very fulfilling, you know, and it gives you peace. The senior population is an ever-growing population in the United States, and especially here in New York City. And it's very important that we create services and expand on services that are for the older adult population. What they do and say isn't valued nearly as much as it should be. Let's take that wisdom and celebrate it and find ways to use it and express it. There is a saying that you have to paint 1,000 paintings before you get your first painting. And I'm still working with my first 1,000. I'm like flabbergasted. That's awesome. They were great. I, I see some George Surratt in there, a yeah. little bit of Van Gogh. I mean, whatever it is, what is so remarkable to me is in some of the works you can see their wisdom and their life experience in it. Yeah. Not just their canny artistic 
nature and their knack for putting these things together, but also their wisdom and life experience that seems to be coming through and transcending yeah. the canvas. And their, their own personality as well. You mm -hmm. heard the one woman there say that she had never picked up a paintbrush before going to that class. And you can see how her colorful personality, I'll say that, obviously comes out in her painting because you saw she had on the very colorful sweater there yeah. and a lot of those same <laughs> colors were in the painting that she was that's working on. True, yes. So it's it's that's another way that she can express uh, th that vibrancy that obviously lies uh, beneath the surface and there. They, and they picked everything. One was just the lamp and you could see the light bulb and the shade was slightly askew and yeah. that's sort of a more modernist look and then there was the Brooklyn Bridge and then you had other you know. Yeah and the same woman who did the one with her with the uh, the child walking through the trees. Yeah. That was really cool. That was great. I know Beautiful a little bit stuff. of a winter scene there. Yeah. Um, good stuff. That's just great. Now the, the uh, it's called Art in the Time of Wisdom and the exhibit is continuing at the uh, Callahan Gallery at St. Francis College through the end of the month. So go ahead over there and check it out. Yeah, you still have some time. Looks great. Well, that is it for tonight. Uh, Jesus in the Koran. That's right. Some surprising insight from a Catholic scholar. That's coming up tomorrow. Remember, you can always watch us online at carnsny.net and check out our Facebook page as well. Until next time, I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great night.